Okay. Good to talk, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, tonight, I want to share with you two mind-boggling stories. There isn't a commonality, uh, the common denominator of these stories, other than the fact that they're just mind-boggling in how you see the the uh, Ruach HaKodesh, the divine inspiration of a tzaddik, and how a tzaddik's words and actions are far-reaching and uh, re- literally um, make you shake your head and like wonder like about the incredible divine inspiration of tzaddik. First story I heard from Rabbi Shneir Ashkenazi from Yisrael, who checked all the details of the story. There was a Biyalar Chassid who was in the diamond industry who had a um, colleague who worked on the same floor as he did. And after um, uh, they exchanged pleasant trees one day, the man tells his friend, he says, by the way, um, I want to tell you that I have some inheritance from my father that I'm trying to get rid of because my father and I didn't get along so well. And I want to give you something I inherited from my father just because I... Um, Sorry about that. I just want to give you something that I inherited from my father because my father and I, this is the fact that it's not, it's not so pleasant. This is the fact that we didn't get along so well. And therefore, I want to, um, I want to share with you um, things that I don't want to keep that I had from, got from my father. Uh, and he gave him a check, a check that had come from the Rebbe's secretary for $200. So he receives the check. And shortly after receiving this check, he is invited to spend Shabbos at the home of Rabbi Menachem Volpe. He comes to the home of Menachem Volpe with his wife to spend Shabbos there. They were friends for a while. And um, Rabbi uh, Volpe Rabbi, you're muted. Should I start again? Where, where are we up to? Am I muted for a while? No, ju- just two seconds. Okay. So basically, this guy gets this check from the Rebbe's secretary, from his friend who had received it from his father. Is the video working? It's highlighted? It's unmuted? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So he got this check from um, from his... his uh, from his colleague, a business colleague, and he takes the check and he brings the check with him to the home of Rabbi Menachem Volpe, who had invited him for Shabbos. Rabbi Menachem Volpe runs a a whole constellation of institutions in Israel, and he gave him as a gift for staying in his home for Shabbos. He gave him this this check. So Rabbi Volpe, very thankful, very appreciative of the check, and he says to him. Uh, that he's giving this to him just because, you know, we're here for Shabbos and, and we were so, so thankful and appreciative. And here's something I thought you'd appreciate. Here's a check that your Rebbe wrote. Wow, this is something unusual. Thank you so much. We are very appreciative. Wow, something from the Rebbe is, is, is very precious to us. Thank you. So he leaves their home, goes back to his home. And this Biala Chassid was um, invited to st- attend a diamond show in, in Russia. He travels to Russia, and at this diamond show, the, he, staying, he was staying in uh, whatever city it was in Russia, he ended up going to some kind of Jewish function for some cause. And at this uh, Jewish cause, there was some auction of various items, among them an auction of a dollar from the Rebbe. Now, at this auction, there were some oligarchs there, and they bid on this uh, dollar for this charitable institution, and the bidding went up to forty thousand dollars just for the one dollar from the Rebbe. So he was really impressed, and he thought to himself, he told his wife when he came back home, "We made a big mistake giving away this two hundred dollar check to uh, to these Hasidim because if for one dollar they're willing to give forty thousand dollars, 
Can you imagine if we would have could have sold this check for probably who knows how much money? His wife is really upset. She's like, you're right. Let's call Rabbi Volpe. Let's get the check back. He said, one second. Let's ask our Rebbe. They went to the Biala Rebbe. Biala Rebbe said, you shouldn't ask for it back because this check was given to Rabbi Volpe and he is running a charitable institution. And therefore, uh, it's like giving it to charity. You can't ask for it back. All right. Can't ask for it back. Can't ask for it back. After Rabbi uh, 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 Volpe uh, was, uh, after, I don't know how much time it was, a week, a month, whatever it was, Rabbi Volpe calls up the home of this Bialo Chassid to ask for a donation for his institutions. Who answers the phone? His wife. And she tells him, you know, Rabbi Volpe, we'll give you double what you're asking for. But we're really upset at you. Why are we upset at you? We're upset at you because we didn't know what we're giving you. We thought we we're giving you a regular housewarming gift, a, a regular gift you give to someone instead of a bottle of wine. We gave you a, this, this, this check for the Lubavitch Rebbe. We didn't know how valuable it is to Hasidim, how much people would pay for it, and how much we were losing by giving it to you. So we like it for, we, we're not going to ask for it back, but we're upset. My Volpa said, listen, I will give it back to you in a second. I just happened to use this gift you gave to me for pure kindness. I don't have it anymore. What do you mean? In Israel, there is a city called uh, Ramat Gan, and the, there was a Chabad rabbi there. His name was Mati Gil. And Mati, Mati was very successful in, in erecting a, a school and other institutions in Ramat Gan. And he passed away, unfortunately. And his widow and their children came to me, Rabbi Volpa said, and they asked me, for assistance in trying to cover the huge debts they had in their institutions, as well as uh, advice. And I decided, I just got from you this check, I'm gonna give them this check as a blessing for them. And I gave them the check. So this Biala Chassid's wife was not uh, impressed. And she called up the widow, Rabbi Gal, and asked for the check back. The widow of Rabbi Gal, Mrs. Gal said, we'll be happy to give it back to you, but I just wanna tell you that we don't have it anymore. What happened was, was that there was a, uh, after my, father, my husband passed away, there was a lot of debt and accumulated in our Chabad center and the various institutions and programs that we were running. And we were really trying to survive. And someone came forward and he rescued all of our institutions with a huge donation. And as a token of appreciation as a, and as a blessing, we gave him this check that you were given us. Okay, nothing you can do now. But he goes back to work and he's, the story is bothering him. And he sees again this colleague and he asks him, I just want to ask you a question. Hasidim have dollars from the Rebbe. Nobody has checks. How in the world did you get this check from the Lubavitch Rebbe? Where did it come? How did your father get it? So he tells this, this Bial Chassid, it's an interesting thing. You see, my father had a friend in Matigal. My Matigal's institutions many years ago were about to go be under, under foreclosure. And my father rescued Matigal and gave him a lot of money. And as a token of appreciation, Matigal received a donation from the Rebbe himself to help, help him. And he gave this check to my father to thank him. So here, Matigal had given this check to this man that he had got from the Rebbe. And now somehow through a whole series of, of divinely orchestrated events, the check came back to the widow of Matigal, who was again used to again rescue all the institutions in Ramadan. An unbelievable story of divine providence and how the words of a tzaddik and action of a tzaddik how are, 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 are eternal. And have, it, 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 like the Torah says about Meshach and about Moses, that the, word, the action of Moses, the, Moses and the words of Moses are eternal. That's the first story. I have another story for you. This story is a favorite story of mine. It's a really, really, really long story. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I'll just tell you a part of the story that's relevant this week's Torah portion. This story is from the time of the Alter Rebbe, a few hundred years ago. And it's about the war between the Haskalah movement and Orthodox Jewry and Hasidim in particular. The Haskalah movement sought to infiltrate all of the various bastions of, of Orthodox Jewry. And they wanted to convince people to, to uh, become, uh, to, to cast off 
their observance of Torah. And to that end, they would dress as various, uh, as very religious people and, and gain confidence of leaders of the Jewish people and use this confidence to try to ensnare souls to their path of heresy, the skull movement. And this is a story of a certain Shimon. Shimon had managed to become very close with the leaders of Jewry in Vilna. He became in charge of a whole network of schools and he used his influence to send the top scholars of these schools towards to, to cities in Europe where they would become indoctrinated with heresy on the guise of sending these students to these to the to Torah, to Torah centers that he was recommending. So the scholar movement realized that the Hasidim are very successful in keeping Torah alive in their in their neighborhoods and their communities, and they sent Shimon to pose as a, a school teacher and uh, to try to ensnare the Hasidim in, uh, and to see what he could do, to see what he could discover. The Hasidim discovered who he was and they discovered all the things that he had written down. What they discovered is actually a treasure trove of history because you're not hearing a story you know, from someone who is Hasidically inclined someone who maybe embellished things for the sake of, of proving the authenticity of, of his path in, in, in serving God, you're talking about someone who is a heretic. And he describes in detail the Alter Rebbe's court and the Alter Rebbe's children and what life was like. And it's incredible. I, I recommend everyone to read it from the, in, in which it's compiled in the, in the previous Rebbe's memoirs. And, uh, it's, it's astonishing. He, he describes how he came and what day he came and what he saw and the shape of the altar of his house and his different floors and what it was in each, each room. Just one caveat, he describes how it's amazing by divine providence at this exact day that he was visiting, uh, the grandson of the altar Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, was, he wanted the Hasidim to bring him to the place where the altar Rebbe was, was born and in order to uh, get this treat, they told the Tzemach Tzedek, who was just a child, to share with him the last thing he was learning with his grandfather. And he describes how the Tzemach Tzedek is a young boy, and he's talking about pi, the mathematical theory of pi, and the various opinions of Tosfos and Rashi, and how they address pi, and, and through geometry and mathematics, Hadat Tzemach Tzedek is explaining the various opinions of Pai, and he is astounded listening to the Tzemach Tzedek. There is a, um, a uh, hotel or inn he's staying at, and he wanted to see the Alter Rebbe. He wanted to meet the Alter Rebbe. And he found out that the Alter Rebbe was not, didn't go out to the public, except for on, on Shabbos. He had arrived a few days before, and he wanted to see the Alter Rebbe. But he heard that the Alter Rebbe, on, the way, on his way to Mikveh, you could see the Alter Rebbe, or the Alter Rebbe would come down to read the Torah. Monday and Thursday, otherwise you wouldn't see the Alter Rebbe. So he wanted to see the Alter Rebbe, and the Alter Rebbe, he, he, on Friday morning, he wasn't able to see the Alter Rebbe on his way to the Mikveh because he got sick. He got so sick that he couldn't move. And he says he got, uh, he's, he was, had a high fever and for three days and nights, he really couldn't move. On the fourth day, he also was very sick, but his, the person he was staying at, the innkeeper he was staying at took care of him and with salts and with, with uh, blankets and, and uh, vinegar, whatever various medicines were used at that time. He, um, the, the, the innkeeper wanted him to sweat more. That was considered to be a, a method of, of, of uh, treatment for the fever that he had. So anyways, after three days and nights, on the fourth day, Monday morning, he finally was able to stand up and he gets an audience with the Alter Rebbe on Wednesday. In general, he said, that in order to get an audience with the Alter Rebbe, there were three days of preparation. The Hasidim would say, they would say the prayer that, 
that is said at, at, at midnight, where people cry about the temple being destroyed and ask for Mashiach to come. And he's there um, uh, uh, getting a, preparing for three days and nights officially, but he's, of course, he's just, this is, this is meaningless to him. And he, uh, and when he was living in, in Vilna, he um, was telling, oh, oh, he was considered to be someone that people consulted as because of his position as in, in the, as a principal of this network of schools. And he always would extol the virtues of the Siddur the Alter Rebbe, because the Siddur the Alter Rebbe was written with such um, precision according to Hebrew grammar and in general the Haskalah movement as a way of infiltrating into the uh, other Jewish circles, they would highlight the need of learning about Hebrew grammar. And by learning about Hebrew grammar, that was meant as a guise to, to try to, uh, to get, get uh, is focusing on the grammar of the, of the Torah instead of focusing on the content of Torah and thus bring in other, other, other philosophies and other sciences and heresy through to, to young, young uh, impressionable minds. So he had a, uh, he had an, he had seen the Siddur al Rebbe, he had told many people that the Siddur al Rebbe is so, so nice, but the Hasidim uh, were skeptical about who he was. They didn't know who he was, but that's what happened when he was in Vilna. And he was getting back to his trip to Liyajna. He managed to get an audience to al on a Wednesday. Do you ever wonder what would happen if the Alter met a spy who's trying to spy in the Alter Rebbe? This is an incredible story. He is, comes to an audience to Alter Rebbe on a Wednesday. And the Alter Rebbe on his table would always have a chumash, a zohar, and two candles. The Alter Rebbe, he, 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 when he walks into the Alter Rebbe's room, the Alter Rebbe says to him, what can I do for you? So he tells the Alter Rebbe that he is from uh, Zamut, and he uh, has a problem. His problem is that he always tells everyone, all other school teachers, that they should teach Hebrew grammar. And they all don't want to learn Hebrew grammar because, because they say that it's, that we should teach the kids linguistics too. They thought it's not something that's important. And I know, says Shimon to the Alter Rebbe, that the Alter Rebbe considers uh, Hebrew grammar to be very important, as I can tell from the Siddur that he wrote that how incredible the Siddur is of the Alter Rebbe and it's how it's polished and the grammar is so beautiful. And therefore, I want you to write for me a letter, he asked the Alter Rebbe, a letter of approbation saying how it's so important to learn grammar and that I, Shimon, should be endorsed for my teaching Hebrew grammar. So the Alter Rebbe leaned on his holy arms on his hands for five minutes. And then the Alter Rebbe said, it's true that it's necessary to know Hebrew grammar and because you have to know how to recite the words of Shema and to write, recite the words of the davening correctly and to recite the words of Sukkot de Zimra, the songs of praise correctly. However, the Alter said, in heaven, the chamber of Hebrew grammar and the chamber of linguistics are close to each other, but in between them, there is another chamber. And that chamber is the chamber of those souls who misinterpret the Torah on purpose. When a person studies Torah during the daytime, so then they are, they're invited in heaven during, at nighttime, to, their soul is invited to, to learn in the same chamber of heaven of whatever part of Torah they study during the daytime. But the author has said, someone studies, studies, studies grammar during the daytime because it neighbors the, the chamber of those who misinterpret the Torah deliberately, it's possible that the soul could enter the wrong chamber. And therefore, you have to be very careful from studying uh, grammar and linguistics because, in other words, that could lead towards heresies, Alter was, was alluding to. Then the Alter Rebbe again leaned his head on his holy arms and he then asked, uh, he asked then he asked this the Shimon a question. He asked Shimon, he said, what, wh how do you um, in share with your students when you're learning uh, this week's parasha, parasha has told us, how do you read the part where it says Yitzchak was seized with great trembling? 
So he says, Shem Tal Zalt Rebbe, I explained this the way Rashi's first interpretation is, that uh, Yitzchak was astounded. Yitzchak was astounded hearing that Esav say that he is his firstborn after just being deceived, so to speak, by Yaakov. So Yitzchak was astounded. That's why Yitzchak was trembling. That's how he explains it. So the author asked him, why don't you explain it to your students according to the second interpretation? Second interpretation is from the Medish, Rashi says that the reason Yitzchak was trembling was because he saw the Gehenim, he saw hell open up under, under Asa. So he tells the Rebbe, in my opinion, you shouldn't fill the pupils' delicate minds with Medrash in general, and especially things which might frighten them, such as Gehenim. And of course, he tells Alta Rebbe, you shouldn't tell small children things they can't even imagine. A child will wonder, how is a huge opening of Gehenna going to fit into the small room of Yitzchak? And number two, how could the fire of Gehenna, he tells Alta Rebbe, which has been burning for 5,555 years, how would come and doesn't consume Asa and Yitzchak themselves? And so the author listens to this, author says, and how does the Medrash know that indeed the Gehenna was open under, under uh, uh, Esav? So Shimon says, he writes in this letter, I didn't answer. I didn't answer because he tells the person writing the letter too, is this the only place that the Medrash and the Talmud say exaggerate, ex exaggeration? I didn't answer. So when the Alter Rebbe saw that he was silent, the Alter Rebbe said, when Esav entered Yitzchak's room, Yitzchak asked him, who are you? And Esav said, I am your firstborn, Esav. Now the truth is, it was a lie. Because Esav had sold his birthright to Yaakov. So when Esav said, I am your firstborn, he was saying a lie. And Yitzchak knew he was a lie, saying a lie. And that's why he was frightened by this lie, because Asa was trying to annul something which is true according to the Torah, according to the law of the Torah. It caused him to tremble because saying a lie causes the open, saying that lie caused the opening of Gehenna to open underneath Asa. When the al finished speaking, he leaned on his forearms again, and then he raised his eyes, raised his head, and he opened his eyes. Again, on the al desk, there were two candles. The Alter Rebbe held a candle and he lifted the candle up. He looked at Shimon and he says, you come here from Vilna, yet you claim you come here from Zamut. You convert little children to the idolatry of Askala, but you claim that you are a Malamed, you claim you're a school teacher. Because of these lies, Alter Rebbe says, the Gehenna is open up underneath you. How many souls have you destroyed already? Yet you continue to rebel. Yes, it's true, the Alter Rebbe said. You are a heretic, and anyone who goes down that road will never return. So Shimon Achaifer is listening to this, and Shimon was in general frightened, he said, when he saw the Alter Rebbe, because the Alter Rebbe said he had such a strong, deliberate voice. When he, even when he walked into the Alter Rebbe's room, the Alter Rebbe's voice uh, had frightened him, and here now, the Alter knows exactly this whole entire story. He was frightened for more than the other reasons. He knew that the Hasidim had taken the, the spies, the, the Haskala movement had sent, and they really beaten them up. They uh, spanked them like a school teacher would spank children the Friedrich Rebbe rights. And he was afraid that he would have the same fate. So he tried, and he realized he's exposed. He, the game is up. He tried to run away, but he couldn't really run away. He was so sick. And... And the Hasidim see is leaving. And the tradition is when you leave the Alter Rebbe's room, you, there's a, something, called, something called the Hasidist, the, the Yechidist dance. So they took him in for the dance. And he didn't want to dance, but they took him to dance anyways. And one of the Hasidim even gave him a kick as a sign, sign of brotherly friendship. They had no idea I know who he was. And he is trying to escape them, but they make him dance. And finally, he has to literally crawl on all fours um, to, to get back to the inn and he escapes. Because he wasn't beaten up. But um, the point, the story is, is that how the Alter Rebbe, without no, uh, with no possible way of knowing, through divine inspiration, the Alter Rebbe knew exactly who he was speaking to, 
what the person was about. He sat straight through the whole the whole guys. And not only that, Al Tarabit gave his shared with him what he needed to hear to help him do teshuva. He had an audience, he did chidis. Usually a chidis, you think of something, you know, that a rabbi has with a chassid and, and uh, to share in a very personal, deep, intimate way, a path in serving God. And here is a chidis, an audience that Alter Rebbe has with someone who is a heretic. And he hears on a, very, on a soul level who he is and where he needs to go to. Anyways, I, um, I was really, really blown away by this story. And I hope you enjoy it as well. And the bottom line is, is that a Jew has to know that a Rebbe, a tzaddik, has no, is not affected by the boundaries of time and space. And when you write a letter to the Rebbe, the Rebbe can hear, can hear and see your letter. And I know I promised you guys two stories, I'm going to tell you a third story. Uh, because listen so nicely, you got a third. This is an unbelievable story, also incredible story. And after this third story, we're going to see the living Torah. This story is about a Jew named Eliezer. Eliezer, is a, this story was shared by the, on the, during the International Conference of Shluchim. This week, the Shluchim had a world's record in Zoom. The, the previous record in Zoom, the longest Zoom, I think it was about two days, three days. The Hasidim had a last week of Lava Malka, and they never stopped a whole week. And they, it was a world record Zoom meeting when the Hasidim in Hawaii were going to sleep, the Hasidim in Australia waking up, and then the Hasidim in the Shluchim, the Rebbe had sent to, to Brazil were waking up, and, and there, there was a continuous flow of Fabrengan in, in Spanish and Portuguese, and it, it was a, actually a world record. So one of the things that was shared by this Fabrengan in, this, in the conference, was the following story. They had a con, in the conference, they have various sessions. One of the sessions was about estrangement. What do parents do when their child is estranged from them? It's a real issue that many Chabad rabbis would deal with around the world. And here was this, this boy, Eliezer, from a home in Jerusalem. And he never managed to, to fit in. He went to, uh, he went to a school and he didn't do well in school. And he decided school wasn't for him. And he decided to move to the United States. And in the United States, he wanted to get into business, but nothing worked for him. He tried one, one enterprise, a second enterprise, nothing worked. After, after his failure, he decided to, uh, he didn't decide, but he got involved, unfortunately, with drugs and alcohol and became homeless. He was living in a car, a stolen car, and it really was, was stuck. One day he says to himself, I just have to leave. I, I'm just, I can't to go home. No, it was hard to go home because he was always telling his parents how well he's doing. Oh, I just bought this company. I sold this company. I'm doing so well. Uh, I bought and sold and I'm doing so well. And his parents, you know, how do his parents know? He's in America and they're, they're in Israel. They're in Jerusalem. So after realizing he has to go home, he, he had to scrape together money. He scraped together $500 to get a ticket. He got the $500. And he's going to the airport. On the way to the JFK, he says to himself, I should go to the Rebbe. And he, JFK is about a 50 minute drive from, from the Ohel. He goes into the Ohel. And outside the Ohel is a place for people to write letters to the Rebbe. So he sits down to write a letter to the Rebbe. When he's writing a letter to the Rebbe, he's, he's, he hasn't written, he's not a, person, he's not a writer. And he doesn't, he's never, never looked in the mirror to, to look at who he is and where he's come from, but he does. He writes a long letter to the Rebbe. And he writes about everything that happened to him throughout throughout his uh, life and how, and how he's stuck and he's in drugs and alcohol and he's going home now and he, and, and, he, and he writes this long, long letter to the Rebbe. But he's so distraught and he's so broken, he can't walk into the Oval to present himself to the Rebbe. He just feels so ashamed and his flight's about to, to, to leave. So he decides, I'm not gonna go into the Ohel even for a second, I'm just gonna go to my flight. He takes the letter, puts it in his pocket and goes to his flight, comes to Israel. It's great to be home, great to see his family. But after a day with his family, he says to himself, Ay, vey, I'm going to go back to the drugs and the alcohol. I can't stop myself. What should I do? He gets a phone call from his sister. His sister was a social worker. Sister says to him, listen, I want to go out with you to dinner. Let's go out to dinner. They go out to dinner. My sister says, listen, you're an addict. You have a problem. I'm your sister. We want, I want to help you. Mom wants to help you. Dad wants to help you. We all want to help you. Just put out your hand and we'll help you. He said, what do you know about me? How do you know about this? So he tells, his sister tells him, when you came home, 
Mom washed your clothing. She found in your pocket the letter you had written to Lubavitcher Rebbe. Think about this. He hadn't even gone to the Rebbe. There was, the Rebbe, so to speak, didn't see his letter. And yet the Rebbe had felt who he was and who he is. And Rebbe, through the, there, there are some things you can only see with your eyes closed. Like we, the Torah introduces Yitzchak's blessing to Esav with Yitzchak being blind. And there's many times, you know, we close our eyes and we say Shema. We close our eyes and we light the Shabbos candles. We close, Hassan can't see the Kali as I have his eyes closed. Why did the Torah introduce the blessing of, of, of uh, Esav with Yitzchak's eyes being closed? And the answer is, sometimes only you could see who someone is is by closing your eyes. Esav had a beautiful soul. And in order to see Esav's soul, Yitzchak had to have his eyes be, be blind, to be sensitive to who he was inside. And in a similar way, that's who we have to think about people in our lives that we don't see any good in them, to close our eyes and realize that to feel the soul. A chasm getting married, he has to be sensitive to who his kala is, not the way he sees her at that time, but to realize there's something there, and, he's, and that's why he's going and making the step that he has to always cherish and never let go of. A woman lighting Shabbos candles has to realize that she's praying for her children, not the way she wants them to be, but the way they really are, and, and to realize that there's something special in them. When a Jew says Shema, he closes his eyes to say, it's not the way the world looks. There's a truth in the world that I can't see with my eyes. And in a similar way, in continuing the theme of these, these two stories, when you write a letter to the Rebbe, you have to realize, although you're, you're, you're in Los Angeles or in New York or wherever you are, and the Rebbe, you're writing a letter to the Rebbe, and, and you can close your eyes because think the, the Rebbe receives the letter. Anyways, speaking of the Rebbe, let's watch the video of the Rebbe. Menachem, please put on the uh, Living Torah this week. Have a good talk, everybody. We'll watch the Living Torah now. Good work, thank you. Shukoyach. Stay on, don't go. We're going to watch the Living Torah. Der <laughs> And you hope noch was to ufton in the world. When the Lubavitcher Rebbe took ill at Shmini Yatzeris, he had asked his Hasidim not to take him out of the realm of the 770 for his care. And it was his verbal request that made the Hasidim worry about the doctor's recommendation that he be taken immediately to a hospital because he was plenty sick. They decided to give me a call. Really, they wanted an extra opinion. But I said, if the Rebbe has this type of support of doctors in New York, and I, and I would be willing to come in myself, we could set up a equivalent coronary care unit right at 770 with all the trappings of a full CCU or coronary care unit in a regular hospital. I immediately got on the phone with some of my colleagues who had trained me at Harvard, uh, Dr. Lewis Tischholz, one of the heads of cardiology at Mount Sinai, I told him this is a very important person for world Jewry. And although he was scheduled to go on a tour of lectures, and he immediately canceled his trip and delegated it to someone else, brought over equipment. He knew exactly what to do. We 
as I got off the plane, one of the uh, deputies of the police department um, and his representative came along and found me. And they had a quick kind of a uh, police motorcade into town. Walked in, and I was greeted by the little Bob Chirpy's wife, Rebson Schnerson, who insisted that I not take any time with her husband until I make kiddish and have something to eat. Your friend, Dr. Tischholz, has gotten things under control. And I want to reassure you that you should make kiddish and have something to eat, and you'll then be my, my man. This was a, I was really impressed by how Dr. Tischholz had got the baby into a matter of medical stability after I'd seen the cardiogram. I really was horrified to see what I saw. This was the worst heart attack I've seen in a living person. The Rebbe was already getting his blood pressure back and communicating. The Rebbe asked, can I heal from this? And I said, it is physically possible. You know, it will be a, somewhat of a long route. And the Rebbe, without even dropping a beat, then asked me, um, what, what is the healing involved? And I said, well, it means that the area that's been injured will become scarred and firm and the rest of the heart will be around it. He said, but I have been reading, as he told me, that there is now biological research with stem cells where you can make stem cells transform into anything, including muscle cells. Can't you use stem cells to recre recreate cardiac muscle cells? It took me by surprise. I was, this is the Rebbe who's acutely sick just hours ago unable to talk and now thinking about the material he had read about stem cell research in an era when no one in any major medical center could have told you anything about stem cell research as we were finishing Yom Tov, so he wanted to address the public and we said this is a pretty heavy request you just got out of you know the preliminary trouble of this heart attack i hate to have you feel stressed <laughs> But I said the one thing we could consider be broadcasting your message to people from the privacy of your room. I spent about 10 days or so on the initial visit in during that time. We had to develop a medical team, and we would often have meetings with Rebbe about the progress of the case. Here you'd have three or four or five doctors sitting in a circle around with the Rebbe, presenting to him information, and the Rebbe listening very attentively. He was perceptive enough to know, to know what, what to draw of all these opinions in his own case. And I think that greatly enhanced his care because it was a, it was a case where five minds were, were better than one. We weren't subjected to the fallibility of a single person, but we were also benefited by the judgment of the Rebbe to draw the best of these five opinions and at the same time not hurt anyone's feelings. And the Rebbe was somehow able to make everyone feel honored. This is a, it was like magic. He did refer to the fact that people expect of him to be making an appearance 
Uh, I think when that came around to test Kislev, he said people are really wondering why I'm not coming out for a far break. But my does not encourage their worry that I'm not doing well. Test Kislev, it was time for him to be able to go down to a far break. And he, of course, had his telemonitoring on. He had his cup of He walked in, had a very receptive, packed house. That I was bending over as if I was deep in study with my gray hat pointing downward and my looking at the monitor at my feet, no one could see because with people packed like that, no one knew there was a monitor on the floor. And it was battery operated, so there was no wiring. Um, so we were busy seeing the Rebbe on monitor and he gets up and gives his first sicha. And for the first time in this whole episode of the heart attack, he starts having really bad arrhythmia, you know, the premature beats way too frequent for safety and comfort. And with Larry Resnick, who's sitting with me, we both are sweating. And we both are aware of this without being able to tell anyone what we're doing, what we're worrying about. But when the Sikha ended, the arrhythmia suddenly magically stopped. I said, oh, thank God we're out of the woods. And after a few l'chaims and a few l'gunim, he was back on the stage again with another sicha, and the exact same thing happened. We didn't even know what to do. Luckily, after two cycles like this, or maybe three, he then went into a discourse called the Mimer, which had a whole different tone to it. I could see that there was a different hush to the crowd. The Nagunim that introduced the Mimer was at a level of, of a, not only a soothing, but a deep effect in one's mind. When the Rebbe gave the mimer, it came off flawlessly. He had a nice, simple, regular rhythm, the kind that we thought we were going to have the whole far bringing. I examined him after each major far bringing as I came in from Chicago to be sure that I wasn't pushing the envelope and allowing him to do too much heat. His cardiovascular measurements were excellent. The Rebbe was in his full strength. He showed vigor and farbrengans. The heart attack was a very extensive heart attack, and on a scale of 10, it would have been rated as a full 10. But yet, because the Rebbe had sort of a strength of character and drive, and because we didn't dampen his enthusiasm too severely, he went ahead and built himself up in a way that made him effective to his Hasid and to the world. This production is made possible through the generosity of the members of the Gem Foundation.